Um, ladies and gentlemen, excellencies, a very warm welcome at the German Marshall Fund for our second transatlantic talk. Um, I am particularly delighted that we have Dr. Norbert Röttgen as our transatlantic talker here with us today. Dr. Röttgen, you all know him, is the chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee in the Bundestag and the former federal minister for the environment. I'm equally pleased that uh, uh, the um, Germany correspondent of the International New York Times, Miss Melissa Eddy, has agreed to lead the conversation today with Dr. Röttgen. The ideas um, of these talks, as those of you may remember who were here last time, is to bring together a policymaker from one side of the Atlantic with a journalist or expert from the other side for a conversation about issues relevant to transatlantic affairs. The tea talks, as we call them internally, are live streamed on the internet. That's why the cameras are here and the production. You may also, if you'd like to tweet, please feel free to tweet. Um, and now I have to look at gmfus.org. The hashtag is gmftalk. Today's talk is about the future of transatlantic relations. By way of a very brief introduction, let me just recall for us all that the last time transatlantic relations, or specifically German-US relations, peaked was in 2008, in the summer of 2008, when then presidential candidate Obama came to Berlin to give his speech. It seemed that at that time, Germans were hoping that the future president but change all these things that they didn't like about the Bush administration. For he would address climate change, he would close Guantanamo, um, he would uh, be extremely multilateral, and many other things that Germans hoped for. Gun control, of course, as well. At that time, polls showed that 83% of Germans had a very favorable, favorable view of the future president. As you all know, that has changed. The trust in the president waned gradually at the beginning and dropped dramatically as a result of the NSA scandal in 2013. Today, polls suggest that only a minority of Germans still trust American leadership. I would even go a step further and say that this, this lack of trust translates also to lack of trust um, in the, shared, the, the famous sh shared values and interests of Germany and the United States. Um, and all this is happening at a time where we need it least. We face multiple international crises, I don't have to mention them all, Ukraine, Syria, Iraq, international, uh, international terrorism, and many, many more. Um, however, the U.S.-German partnership is not only challenged by the erosion of trust that I just talked about, it is also challenged by in internal developments on both sides of the Atlantic, the rise of populist party uh, the uh, and movements uh, that has also touched us here in Germany but in many other European countries as well. Um, add to that economic crisis, euro crisis, social upheavals, sort of challenges related to EU management, and you have a really explosive mix. Um, however, nobody than our speaker today, Dr. Redgen, is better suited to help us understand these issues and maybe shed some light on what this all means for transatlantic relations. Are we looking at uh, long-term estrangement, as some people predict? Are we looking, will the challenges bind us closer together, and so forth. So I look forward to a very interesting conversation that will be uh, expertly led by Ms. Eddy and pass on the floor to you. Thank you. And you will all be included in the conversation after a while. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Heike, for that warm welcome. Welcome to you as well, Mr. Rutgen. Welcome to all of you. Thank you for attending tonight. I hope that this will be a fruitful discussion, and I hope that we can dig a little bit deeper behind this and into this transatlantic relationship. Um, I think for anyone who deals with Germany, certainly anyone 
who is an American spending time in Germany. The transatlantic relationship is something that is constantly discussed. It comes up in the media. It comes up in talk shows. But let's take a step back and open with talking about what is today this transatlantic relationship? You were recently in your home constituency and talking about the global situation, and you said in relation to where we were a year ago and to where we are now, the world is a different place. Could we say the same thing about the transatlantic relationship? And if so, what is it today, and where does it fit in into this altered world? No, I would say we can not yet say that the transatlantic relationship is uh, in a fundamentally different uh, shape. But we can't take it for granted that there is danger that also the transatlantic relationship comes in total different shape. Uh, the transatlantic alliance has been, particularly from a European perspective or from a German perspective uh, in particular, has been a success story. It is a child of the Cold War, uh, of keeping Germany and Europe free, and at the end getting Germany and Europe uh, free and whole. And we thought until one year ago uh, in peace. And uh, the experience of war, we are all a little bit reluctant to use this term, the reappearance of war, I would say, um, caused by Russia, uh, is an experience we didn't consider that we would see this in our future. We thought we had overcome exactly this situation, a Just confrontation. Please, real quickly, when you say we, do you mean we Germans or we Germans and Americans, as in the transatlantic alliance? In any case, I am speaking of myself. Okay. I, 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 I thought this to be inconceivable. Mm -hmm. And I haven't met any person who told me, I, I considered the opportunity that Russia basically was not and did not consider itself be uh, uh, an unavoidable element of a new European security architecture. I thought, and I think we in Germany, the German, the Europeans, I think both on both sides, the Americans and Europeans, thought and considered Russia to be an element of a, secure, of a security architecture. Of course, we were clear Russia is not a democracy. We had a chancellor who at least thought that the president, that President Putin, was a, a, a pure Democrat, but this was not a common sense and view in, in Germany. But we thought it will take some time after permanently get a closer together, after a process of, of mutual modernization, coming closer together, uh, economic integration, uh, enlargement of the, of the inter international institutions, WTO, uh, G7 became G8 and so on. At some time, Russia will transform and the values and politics will follow the economy. And uh, now we made the experience that we were wrong, that we had a false a perception uh, of uh, Russia. And now we, and this is the watershed experience uh, in, in the last year. Mm -hmm. And there was a simultaneous experience of, of the crumbling of this peace order as a result of the bloody 20th century, so not some order, but the mm -hmm. fundamental order. Um, and at the, at the same time, we are facing new challenges, violent, brutal terrorism, uh, which is interconnected with the situation of our societies. Mm -hmm. After Charlie Hebdo, absolutely evident that it's not far away, but that is, it is at home as the, the crisis about Ukraine is in our continent. And the third crisis, I would say, is a kind of European crisis, not only a Euro crisis, but starting from the Euro crisis, I think we have a, a more broader crisis to in, in, with regard to our general 
ability to commonly act in Europe. So crisis at the same time, and last sentence to, to this, the, all these crises are a challenge to the, to the question what is the sense and meaning and future of the transatlantic alliance today? And I think we have not really answered this question. Do you think that we are focusing enough on trying to answer this question? Or do you think that we're still assuming this alliance exists, it is on solid ground, and even if it's somewhat shaken, it, it, it will recover? In any case, we are not focusing on the question how to, how to redefine, how to revive, how to rebuild the transatlantic alliance under new circumstances after the Cold War. And uh, reappearance of war does not mean that we re-enter Cold War circumstances. It's a totally different global uh, and European situation. No, I think we have a sense that, of course, things have fundamentally changed. But I think we have not yet started to readjust mm. the meaning of, uh, uh, of NATO and the transatlantic uh, alliance in a broader sense. What does it mean now? How can we commonly address these challenges? How have we to change ourselves to be effective in the way we were in the last, in the last century? Mm -hmm. um, thinking of that, NATO uh, and, and the strategic alliance, one common thing that comes up from the American side is the Germans need to take a stronger leadership role mm -hmm. in NATO, in foreign policy, in many places. In your assessment, has that happened now with the Ukraine crisis? Do you see that Germany has stepped into, even whether they maybe have wanted to or not? Um, and how do you think that came about? Was that German initiative? Or was that also Washington maneuvering and leaving Germany effectively no other choice? I think Germany is in a process of adaptation. We didn't voluntarily choose to take responsibility, to assume responsibility, but we were, we, we were forced to do so. And I would say uh, in the Russia, Ukrainian crisis. This is the first global or international crisis where Germany assumes the leading role, I would say, to keep Europe together, uh, to be clear on the same time and Europe uh, keeping together, uh, to communicate to Putin, to Russia, uh, not to build a bridge which would mean that we would not be on one side. Uh, but to, to be clear in part of the European <coughs> Union and part of the transatlantic alliance, but on the same time taking responsibility for communicating and trying to resolve, to settle this conflict with Russia and, and, and leading uh, 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 the stance uh, uh, and forging uh, European and transatlantic unity. I think this is uh, new experience for us. We have assumed this role, particularly the Chancellor is doing this job. Uh, I'm not absolutely clear how well known this fact is in the German uh, 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 electorate. Which might but be a good some, thing. <laughs> it might be a good thing, a thing to, to assume the role mm -hmm. and to step by step um, uh, try to make clear that we have to assume responsibility for peace, for a more peaceful, for a more stable continent. Um, but we have, of course, to communicate this better. We have to, uh, uh, to, have to, 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 to deliver transparency. We have to explain the grounds, the reasons, because we have to secure support for this. That is, this is a process, a process of, of adaptation if Germans could, at the, at, at the beginning of the last year, when the Munich Security Conference took place and the federal president made the appeal for more international responsibility, I, I think this was uh, a situation where the Germans would have chosen, if we can, 
freely, voluntarily choose what we want to be, they would have chosen to be a big Switzerland. And my, my assessment is that now, one year later, Germans know that big Switzerland is not a realistic option for Germany. What, but at the same time, I think we have to resist one temptation, and this is the view from outside, from Washington, perhaps from Moscow, from Beijing, uh, which uh, address Germany as to take as Germans and Germany the role. I think we have to answer and to respond. We want to assume more responsibility, but not as Germany as a country, but we see ourselves always acting as, uh, as a part of Europe. My personal view is that all these crises can and have to be understood as a wake-up call for a European role, for European leadership, for European security and foreign policy. And I think we even have to contribute more to this European role. I think we must not leave this European idea and try to pursue a German special role, uh, uh, even when it is described as a responsibility role for Europe, we have to act as a European agent and to contribute responsibility to this role. Mm -hmm. um, thinking on the European level still, uh, and the next great point that we could discuss, Europe, United States, is TTIP, free trade agreement. Uh, we were talking a bit earlier that 20% of Americans uh, don't think it will bring them jobs. TTIP does not appear in the media in the States. It's not something that is discussed over here. We hear about chlorine chickens. We hear about Nuremberg sausages that are supposed to be made in Kentucky. Um, what do you, where do you see this going? Can we take this overly charged emotional European debate and bring it down, or German really debate, and bring it down to a level where we can get somewhere and can we bring the American public on board to, to make this a success? Do you see this as, as a possibility? I would say it is in any case a necessity uh, because this uh, to refound, rebuild the transatlantic alliance and partnership, I think, uh, should not be restricted to security uh, items, although they are the most challenging and pressing today. But I think a, a, broad, a more broader view shows that we have a general shift in global architecture. No bipolar situation, no unilateral leadership of the US, but shift of power, power shift, vacuums uh, we see and they will be filled by others. So I think TTIP is only properly understood when we see the geostrategic importance of forging and bringing together the two big markets which stand for 50% of global GDP in order to get a leverage and in order to or in order to get and assume a role to to contribute to global rule setting what we experience is global chaos and i think our big challenge is to give global chaos a global order. And I think we can assume the role and uh, the ambition to say that we, to claim that we want to contribute good, liberal, tolerant, democratic rules to the global order and forging this uh, trade, u trade unity and entity would contribute a lot to this geostrategic rule-setting position. But at the same time, we have missed um, the necessity to explain our peoples in Europe what uh, this agreement is about. And so we have, uh, 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 there, there, is, and, and there, has, uh, there has emerged a vacuum, and this is, uh, was filled mostly with, um, with concerns, um, questions, uh, agitation, anti-Americanism. This 
European sense, which is very, very broad and should not be in any case underestimated, of a general sense that people feel a loss of control. Do we have any say in, in things that matter or is this all this anonymous international capitalistic system we, 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 are, we have to surrender to and uh, democracy does not work because democracy is nation oriented, our reality is global, so democracy is without, without a say and without clout and there is a lot of populist uh, 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 polemic against this and there are politicians and parties organizing uh, 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 and, and making use of these feelings of, of, of fear and concern. And so we are in a defensive and it will be a hard, hard job with, to, come, to overcome the situation, to reset, to reset the narrative with rational, uh, smart arguments. So we are in, in the defensive. We have allowed to become uh, to, 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 to be in a defensive uh, position, and we have to uh, to unite our our arguments and force argumentative force to come in a more positive uh, a note uh, a notion of this uh, project. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, thinking of resetting narratives, I want to go back and touch on the NSA um, and. It occurred to me that when you go way back, when you go back to September 11, 2001, the perception of Americans was that the Germans had slept, been asleep at the wheel. They let these terror cells grow up on their territory. They were not capable of tracking them down, and September 11 happened. So then we move ahead to last year, where we had the NSA scandal, where now the German perception is the Americans had gone too far to the point of listening in on the Chancellor's cell phone. So now we've come almost for full circle, if you will. Where do we go from here? And what role do you think that Charlie Hebdo, that you mentioned, might have played in this, that suddenly we're hearing um, far more subtle voices saying, we, cannot, we, Germany, cannot fight terror alone, this threat is in our backyard, and we are dependent on the Americans. Do you think this is going to shift the deep mistrust of the German populace in the U.S. listening mechanism, if you will, that they view the NSA to be? I would say there are two, two elements which are, which, uh, are in, in the German mind. The one is, of course, we know that there is a terrorist threat and challenge, and we knew this before Charlie Hebdo, but now it has become uh, in a very uh, a dramatic way, again, uh, evident for, for Germans, for Europeans and worldwide that we are facing a, a big terrorist brutal threat and that we have to apply uh, the tools of, of democracies to fight these challenges. And we know this. And on the other side, our perception is that we thought we should do this together. And Germans do not perceive their government as part of a terrorist threat. So they thought, we are friends. You may say this is a quite naive understanding of, of the relation of governments. But this is a prevailing understanding. We, are, we stand together. We, we stand together against terrorist threats. And for this reason, there is no need to uh, to, to eavesdrop uh, German ministries and ministers and the chancellor, and this was perceived as a was perceived as as a as a demonstration of mistrust uh, uh, and and a kind of violation of our personal relationship and of the values we thought we share, and this has not been fixed, and I think there will be there will be this. A confrontation of different perceptions of the role of intelligence and uh, uh, of the cooperation in this field will continue and uh, my perception is that uh, the American administration will not readjust substantially. The president was quite clear that there will not be a fundamental change in, in the policies and so I would say it will remain a toxic issue 
in our relationship. Unfortunately, but yes. How could we fix it? What, what could Washington do that would help Germany, spe specifically the German government, to feel they can trust the Americans as partners again? To my, at least by starting a serious dialogue about our different perceptions in this field. I think we have to, to really uh, substantially debate about it. And my perception is that f in, in the domestic uh, politics in the US, this question of applying intelligence abroad does not play a significant role. And of course, I can understand every president who would argue and would change uh, the intelligence policies towards uh, um, uh, um, countries like Germany and other European countries uh, and would withdraw intelligence activities uh, would be confronted with massive uh, accusations you are endangering the country and so it is a risk, uh, would be a, risk, a risky move to do. But I think we should uh, uh, come into a serious debate about our different perceptions and ideas in this field. But my expectation is that uh, this uh, serious debate and dialogue will not happen. So it will be left as a point of discontent and of disagreement um, with some contagious effects on our relationship. You've kind got of frozen conflict. Frozen conflict. Okay. Um, one more question and then I will open up to the floor. So all of you who have a question, get ready. Um, frozen conflict. We're going to go back to Copenhagen. Energy, climate mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. You said that you did not believe that China was in a doesn't you, China doesn't want to lead and the U.S. cannot lead in terms of carbon emissions. In November of last year, they made what they consider mm -hmm. a historic agreement. Do you consider that agreement to be historic? And what role do you think it will play as we now look ahead to Paris and to the attempts mm -hmm. to secure? Mm -hmm a new global climate change or new global accord to combat climate mm -hmm. change i think there is uh, there is some space for being optimistic there i think obama has decided to take a very bold uh, 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 and c very bold commitment to combat climate change to make this policy uh, uh, in the last 2 years uh, of his presidency as part of his legacy uh, and I think if we would manage to forge a new uh, uh, alliance and a cli climate policy alliance, a transatlantic alliance to combat climate change, this would contribute significantly to a refounding of transatlantic uh, uh, alliance because it would demonstrate that the Americans and the Europeans share a common understanding that they are able to act in a common way towards new vulnerabilities which we did not see in the last century but which is uh, uh, an urgency of 21st century. And if we would address these new challenges and new vulnerabilities especially of the modern and developed countries like climate change, like energy, policy also in the, in, the, in the sense of energy security policy, resource security. And if we would combine this with a, a, a commitment to the traditional threats, which means military security, fighting terrorism, I think this would contribute to, to demonstrate a credible new approach for transatlantic, uh, for, 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 for for a sense of uh, that the, the transatlantic partners would try and uh, strive to be uh, global team players 
towards the threat of the 21st century. So this could a new happen. mission, if you will. It's a new mission, yes. And yeah. climate change, I think, uh, would mm. be at the, at the heart of, of such a new mission. Mm. Which almost brings us back to where we yep. started. So it's a perfect point to open up to the floor. I would ask you um, two things. One, please give us your name and who you represent. <laughs> and uh, keep all questions and comments relatively brief so that we have a chance to get everybody in. Okay, sir, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Simon McDonald, I'm the British ambassador, and I would like to go back to Ukraine. Um, I don't think there's been a problem uh, of German leadership. I think Germany has been leading. I don't think there's been a problem between uh, Germany or Europe and the United States. I think we're pretty well bound together on Euro Ukraine policy, mm -hmm. uh, where there has been a problem is within Europe. Um, that although Germany has set a very strong lead and uh, a number of uh, other member states have agreed and supported, there is significant disagreement. Uh, and this clearly is on the mind of Mr. Putin, who uh, believes that the sanctions regime we now have will expire in the summer. Uh, because it can only be rolled on if all 28 members agree. agree. So I wonder, do you see there is a danger of, of the division in Europe? And I wonder how you would counter uh, this division in Europe. Unfortunately, uh, I, I share the concern <laughs> you expressed. Um, my, my basic understanding of the crisis is that our response to this or for our response uh, to, to the challenge we are facing is that European unity is the most important strategic good that we the Europeans and the Americans and the Europeans together have. And I'm, I, I, I'm very clear and expect that Putin will try in this year 2015 to split the unity. This is the tactical overarching uh, goal of Putin for 2015. I think he, he thinks that he has some time, one year, two years, that he can manage the economic mess. And in this time he tries to permanently destabilize Ukraine because this is the conflict about Ukraine becoming a success or Ukraine becoming a failure. And uh, the second thing he, he tries to get is to split our unity. And he tries to split the Americans from the Europeans. He tries to split European states among themselves. Italy, France, Germany, Hungary, now Greece, falling apart. It would be a big success. And he will try to split within European societies. This is the reason why the Kremlin is financing Marine Le Pen and the Front National and other right-wing populist destructive parties. So, <coughs> so uh, uh, preserving European unity against the hegemonial claim of Putin is the strategic question if Europe meets the challenge of Putin or if we fail. I think it is not clear if we will see European success or failure. And the question is, will we stick together, stay our cause and preserve unity? And this unity, which was forged, I would really say, by a leading role of Angela Merkel, will be challenged uh, because there is a manifold or a variety and, and, and multitude of, of national Intra, uh, interests, economic, political interests, and so it will be um, an existential question and challenge for Europe. And I think the awareness of this, do we want to risk European failure? Do we want to risk Europe again be divided between a free Europe and a hegemonial zone under Putin's and Russian influence. This is what is at stake and we have to be clear about it. And it cannot be, there, there is no, it cannot be dictated, but it has to be created by each member of the 28 
uh, 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 members of the European Union. If I can just follow on that real quickly, how great right now? One re uh, excuse me, one uh, reason why the UK should <laughs> stay a member of the European Union because the... I was the wondering why that was not in the there. Facility. Without your strengths, we will not succeed. <laughs> to what extent is, is there real concern that Greece and the current Greek young Greek, new Greek government provides fertile ground for destabilization for Putin? There, <clears throat> there are some early, very inappropriate statements now by the Prime Minister and the new government. I think we will have to come to terms. Uh, with Greece and Greece will have to come to terms with its idea of European solidarity. I think we all want to stay Greece within the EU and the Eurozone. My personal view is that I do not argue for a change of policy towards Greece, of course not, but I think we have to listen to this vote of protest. I think we have to more be clear about the domestic situations in countries like Spain, Greece, France, Italy, with youth unemployment rates above 40%, 50% for years, that this will not, cannot be a strategy to, to stabilize Europe when there are such fundamental <coughs> economic, uh, um, what is it, uh, messy situations, we have to address these situations on the one side, I think, and we have to do it more uh, uh, decisively. But on the other side, uh, uh, the, the countries like Greece have to see these problems are not caused by other European countries, they are not caused by the euro, but uh, the lack of productivity, competitiveness uh, and over situations are caused in the countries and they have to be resolved uh, by economic transformation for more competitiveness, more productivity. Uh, so we have to forge a package uh, of reform, more competitiveness and at the same time for more investment, more jobs uh, it is a combination of economic and political strategy. It is Europe of citizens and if we, if we lose the support of citizens, of broad parts of the citizens uh, in countries, uh, we will not uh, uh, succeed in, 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 in keeping the European Union together. But we cannot expect, expect any blackmailing. Uh, uh, that the European uh, uh, unity in foreign <coughs> policy and security uh, of uh, topics and challenges uh, is, 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 is made a bargain ship for, for uh, economic interests. This can fundamentally not be accepted at all. Sir, you had a question. Thank you very much. Um, Giovanni Pugliese, I'm the Deputy Chief of Mission at the Italian Embassy. Uh, just a brief comment, I think, when it comes to uh, sanctions to Russia. Uh, I think Europe, it happened during our presidency, but Europe showed unity, in fact. And, uh, there, were, there was discussion, there was a different sort of yes. opinions, but eventually, in a relatively short time for European standards, a set of sanctions was approved. So um, I think we should stay optimistic for the future, also from this point of view. But I want to come back to TTIP. We, you mentioned TTIP, how crucial uh, this, um, uh, this process is. Uh, and I agree, I think everybody agrees that it is very important for the credibility uh, of uh, Euro-Atlantic, uh, uh, transatlantic relations uh, to show that we can agree on, on an important set of uh, trade rules. Uh, what is your view? I mean, we know also that the window of, of opportunity is uh, short. There's always something going on, new elections and new uh, elements could, could uh, constitute a burden. How do you see, I mean, it was raised during our presidency, the idea of uh, having an interim agreement, uh, by which I mean uh, putting together the issues on which uh, Europe and America can agree, uh, and even by side those where it is not. Is it better not to have an agreement or to have an interim agreement? That's, that's an important issue, I think. 
we bundle them? There's another yes, okay. question. Yes, okay. We should bundle, bundle some questions. Yeah, yeah, of course. It's another one on TTIP. Okay. Okay, okay fine. Uh, Simone Oker Braun, Friedrich Naumann Stiftung. Um, I wonder whether you see a link between two topics you touched upon in your discussion, um, which is TTIP on the one hand and NSA on the other. Mm -hmm. um, because I personally wonder why TTIP is such a big issue in, in the German public and not in other European countries with a strong aversion against TTIP, or at least the strongest aversion. Um, do you think there could be a link between the, the disappointment with um, uh, the US uh, with regard to the NSA scandal and um, a willingness to, to carry on or, or f force the, the, the TTIP um, uh, negotiations? Mm -hmm. Perhaps the first remark and question, I think we should not uh, start with a low ambition, uh, but we should try to have and remain uh, and preserve a high ambition, which would mean that in 2015 uh, uh, the American administration would have to gain fast track authority, or how do you call it, this Yes. Right. The this president effectively yes. needs, the Obama administration needs yes. to gain this fast track authority to be yeah. able to approve it. So this is one prerequisite in order to, to come to, to some result. And then we should go as far as we can. Uh, in any case, this TTIP agreement will be a kind of living agreement where you have to build on what you have achieved. It's such a big, huge range of, of topics of, of technical nature. I think you can't do this in one year, but you can achieve some progress and some result as much as we can, and then we should build up. I think this could be a very, very uh, 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 sensible uh, uh, approach to, to achieving and making progress. I think in any case, we cannot afford a backlash in, in a project which was thought to, to give expression to the, to the vividity of, of uh, transatlantic relations. So get as far as we can and then continue. This could be, I think, a smart approach. TTIP, why is TTIP? I think, and would be interested to hear, I think in, in France and Italy, TTIP also is uh, an issue of controversy. But maybe in Germany it may be uh, the number one uh, country where TTIP is uh, uh, in a very, very emotional way discussed and debated and we have campaign in the internet and so on. Um, one reason I think is NSA. NSA created a kind of mistrust, uh, as I said, a toxic uh, uh, issue which has a contagious effect and burden, a collat collateral burden for other uh, uh, pieces and, and items of our cooperation and partnership. I think this is the case. And it fueled anti-Americanism in Germany. And uh, without a degree of anti-Americanism, you can't understand uh, the debate about TTIP. I would be quite clear about this. If, if, if this would be an agreement with any other country, let's say, no, no, I would not. I, I was tempted to, to, to give an example, I, I do not. It would not have this, this uh, role uh, and importance and relevance in the public debate. So it is uh, uh, significantly an American issue. Uh, it contributes to this feeling, uh, of course, this is a big economy and uh, by this, and it can be perceived as a big, important project of, ant uh, of international capitalism, of what I was talking about, that democracies are uh, losing their cloud on rule setting, that you have a privatization of the, ju ju of the judiciary, uh, not state uh, uh, courts, but private arbitration. Uh, solutions and settlements and so on. So it contributes to all these feelings of feeling of, of concern, of fear and, and so on, of, uh, of losing control. Uh, and this is this is a major uh, element of this, um, uh, and this is the reason. But the NSA definitely, I would say, contributed 
to this anti sense, which is a, a relatively broad sense in Germany, unfortunately. Just yeah. Quickly, if it succeeds, do you think it could help recede or help to ameliorate somewhat that anti-American sense in Germany? Could it be a positive factor and, it, and change the tables? Absolutely. I'm, I'm convinced of this because I'm convinced of the economic benefit for both sides of this agreement. It will, it will express our ambition uh, for free market, and this is the, the constitution of Germany, of Europe, a fundamental free market, of course, which has a social order, and we will see uh, uh, with standards and rules that we also internationalize our rules and standards, and then it will, of course, create the experience of normality. We will see there will not be this big economic occupation of our daily life by TTIP, but uh, we will see positive economic effects uh, and we will see that it contributes, yes, to, 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 to create and to forge international standards. And I think we will make the experience that in terms of human rights, of nature conservation, ecology, the American European values are our identity much more than, for example, China will set the rules. This is a different understanding of human rights, uh, social rights or ecologi ecological rights. And I think this approach that we, uh, uh, that we are arguing and uh, working for our values to make sure that what we have established as a national or European order, which we call soziale Marktwirtschaft, and which we argue very much in favor of, and this is the basis of the German Wirtschaftswunder, that globalization forces us to internationalize this order. And so it is, I think, a big, big approach to, to, to contribute to rule setting in, towards global uh, disorder. I would love to pick up that idea with Amazon and Verdi, but I don't know if we have time. Um, <laughs> sir, in the back corner, you had a question. Johannes Ahlefeld, uh, and as I'm not tasked with foreign policy anymore, this is a private comment. Uh, one related to TTIP, and I think, I think it follows up on what you just said, Chairman. Uh, what do we know about the statues of the negotiations that our American partners co are conducting in parallel in the context of TPP? And how may this affect our negotiating strategy with a view to creating global rules or setting global rules? In, I'm sorry, I what didn't what understand. In context of what? In the context of TPP. TPP. Yeah, Trans-Pacific okay. Partnership. And what is your question in this context? I mean, we, with view to setting global rules, yeah. what will we know about it and how is this not knowing or knowing affecting the way we can negotiate? Thank you. Yeah? And the second I point really, is... I didn't really <laughs> get your point, to be honest. What? The, 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 there's another one. The, okay, we try. The, the, the <laughs> we'll, one. we'll try yeah. the second one. <laughs> uh, the, the point is, if we talk about global rules and yeah. and let's say a global trans uh, transatlantic marketplace yeah. in the information age, yeah. uh, is there a chance that, that it will be a starting point for setting global rules uh, for the the age of co global communication, defining norms and rules for internet governance and the like? Or is it more likely to be a marginal issue, not really affected no. by TTIP? Of course, the governance of the internet is, is, a, is, is a challenge of its own, of course. Um, uh, and a special sense of freedom and of non-regulation. But apart from this, my, my, my conception or my thinking is that it is about a big, big step to, as I, as I mentioned and outlined, to, to try to give global disorder a global order. And the question is, who fills the vacuum? Uh, the Chinese are very much trying to do this. They are uh, uh, building new parallel international institutions, alternatives to IMF, to the World Bank. And this is, of course, to exercise influence by establishing institutions. And I think uh, they have the right to do so. And if we have a competition of systems and values, I think we, do, we will have this. And my plea is to, to contribute to this. 
with, with European values, with American and European values, and to give expression to our values, to institutions and legal frameworks. This is my approach and my, my main perception of the importance uh, of, of TTIP and TPA. <coughs> we have time, oh, wonderful. Time for one more question, sir, in the orange jacket. Right, my name is Benjamin Mack. I'm a journalist here in Berlin. And the Kremlin announced today that North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is going to be a guest of honor at Victory Day celebrations in May. How much of a concern to Europe, to the United States, is Moscow's warming of relations with North Korea? And what can be done, do you think, in your personal opinion, to discourage Russia from increasing its relations with nations like North Korea, like Syria, and like Iran? Now, these are the very, very different countries. I think our clout to convince Putin not to engage with North Korea is, is very uh, low and, and very small. Um, uh, perhaps in, in a general response to this, my Putin tries quite the opposite of the Chinese approach. The Chinese are integrating, the Chinese try to give an answer, a Chinese answer to globalization. Uh, in a very, very clear way. Putin's approach, if he has, uh, I would say he does not have a strategic approach, but what he is actually doing is to insulate, to isol isolate his country in the global, globalized reality. And I think this is the reason why he will fail, definitely fail, because this is definitely inappropriate to the global challenges. You have to give an answer to this, to the growing interdependencies, and you simply cannot. Even the US would not successfully be able to, to isolate from global interdependencies. We are living in an interdependent world, and you have to, to be part of it in order to, uh, to uh, ex exercise influence, and Putin thinks he can insulate and isolate the country. And so North Korea perhaps would fit to this concept. Uh, but you mentioned also Iran and Syria. These are different cases. Uh, for example, uh, with regard to the nuclear talks about Iran, we can state, fortunately, that Russia plays a constructive role. They are not thwarting this process, but they are integrated uh, and, and uh, exercising a positive influence. And our interest is, of course, where possible, wherever is the possibility to integrate and to play with Russia to resolve and settle international challenges and problems. And in the case of Iran and the nuclear talks, it works. Syria. Again, a different situation. Putin uh, uh, and Russia supports the regime of uh, Assad uh, and uh, uh, is, is, is supporting war there and does uh, all the opposite of uh, resolving the crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is again uh, a situation where either the transatlantic uh, partnership proves to be a viable partnership in foreign and security policy, or I think we will see a, a continuation of this impasse. So there are different situations with regard to North Korea, Iran and Syria. Uh, wherever we can, we should engage with Russia. The, our final goal is to reintegrate Russia into a European order. But on the same time, we have to be clear, we cannot compromise on the very, very fundamental rules of the rule of self-determination, uh, the uh, respect of integrity and sovereignty. There are some, uh, some rules which we cannot compromise upon. Yeah. Thank I you very much. You. <laughs> Thank you so much.
Melissa, thank you so much, Dr. Rutgen. Thank you all for joining us for what I thought was an excellent deep dive into transatlantic relations. Naturally, we didn't solve all the issues, but for me personally, it was a treat, I have to say, as somebody who reads the papers every day, to hear Dr. Rutgen talk as a committed transatlanticist, not entirely optimistic, but also not entirely pessimistic, which I think yeah. is just where German, we are. So <laughs> be entirely optimistic is not an option for us. No, 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 <laughs> we are German, exactly, and I am too. Thank you so much. I know it's hot in here. We are now inviting you to join us for a uh, reception, food and drink are outside. Thank you again also to Melissa for joining us tonight Thank and so taking much. time off your busy schedule. Thank you to all of you. I hope to see you again soon for another transatlantic talk and um, enjoy the evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.